Uh, then I would discuss a crisis of motivation to, to consider this problem of explication of finitism because it's not even clear whether this is an interesting question or not. Uh, certainly, in view of the failure of uh, Hilbert's program in its original uh, formulation, maybe there is, no, there is no reason to even to study this question. Uh, then, uh, then I will uh, discuss some uh, examples related to the main principle behind Kreisel's uh, suggestion. It's extension by of a formal system by reflection rule. So it will be some examples discussed. Then uh, I will uh, go back on the original uh, ideas on finitism, uh, which are mainly from the book Hilbert and Berries, foundations of uh, uh, mathematics, then uh, I will turn to Kreisel's uh, solution and his main claims, uh, and finally go about objections and some search for remedy, if, if you like. Okay, so that's a general plan. So let's go to item one. What is finitism? Of course, uh, uh, finitism is a broad let's say, stands in the foundation of mathematics that appeared in the context of Hilbert programs, Hilbert program. According to Hilbert, and later, as explained in Hilbert and Berres, finitism contains those elementary methods of reasoning about finite objects, integers, words, etc., that are beyond any doubt, and in some sense prior to any actual mathematical reasoning. So it was clear for Hilbert, and it was discussed extensively also with this debate with Poincaré and others that one needs to be, one cannot base, uh, one cannot pull, so to say, uh, oneself out of the morass by, by hair. Uh, so one needs to have something in order to start. And uh, uh, that something clearly for, uh, uh, for Hilbert was, uh, some restricted means of reasoning, which are reliable. And this reliability for him was associated somehow with uh, the conception of natural numbers as a potentially infinite totality rather than actual infinity. Because Hilbert viewed actual infinity as the source of philosophical difficulties in mathematics. So he insisted on finitistic methods in the context of his program. Uh, uh, Hilbert's program required uh, uh, two steps, as is well known. So first step is uh, axiomatization of contentual mathematics in some uh, kind of formal system. That's step one and step two, proving the consistency of, of that formal system by finitistic means. So for this reason, uh, it was not necessary for Hilbert, so by reliable in that sense means. So for this reason, it was not necessary for Hilbert to clearly delineate finitistic methods. Only one particular proof was needed, needed to be accepted as finitistic, uh, which could probably be done just by uh, examination of the particular proof. And this would then justify the use of infinite sets in mathematics, because these methods would be proven consistent. And for Hilbert, that was enough to justify the use of such methods. Uh, this was a beautiful idea. However, such a proof never appeared. And Gödel essentially put an end to Hilbert's program in its uh, original form. However, as is also well known, this uh, uh, study did not end uh, at this point. Rather, uh, there are weaker forms of Hilbert program, program usually uh, called uh, the Hilbert's program of establishing conservativity of infinitistic methods or finitistic methods. In other words, uh, uh, proof theory conservation results uh, uh, have been later interpreted as partial answers to weaker forms of Hilbert's program. Uh, typical example of that sort is, for example, the the result that uh, uh, the system of weak Koenig's lemma, second order fragment of fragment of second order arithmetic, is 
conservative over primitive recursive arithmetic, uh, which uh, again, the conservation is proved by in primitive recursive arithmetic, therefore by infinitistic means. And therefore that's a kind of uh, reduction of infinitistic methods involving second order uh, language to infinitistic. So that's how one uh, interprets this weaker, weaker version of uh, realization of Hilbert program in some particular cases. Okay, uh, so let me, uh, uh, to be more specific and to give you uh, the gist of uh, Kreisel's uh, ideas, I would like to remind you about primitive recursive arithmetic. So that's, uh, uh, let's say, sufficiently standard system of, uh, of arithmetic which is by practically all approaches considered to be uh, part of finitistic methods, at least part of finitistic methods. Uh, so finitistically, an example of finitistically acceptable axiomatic system. So the language of primitive recursive arithmetic uh, contains uh, uh, constant zero successor function and equality, and also function symbols for all all primitive recursive programs. So here one should be careful not to confuse uh, primitive recursive functions, extensional objects with primitive recursive programs, that is actual terms from which, uh, which are actual definitions, if you like, of primitive recursive functions. And axioms of primitive of PRA are uh, quantifier free logic in some, in some forms of so propositional logic, but in the language of predicate uh, calculus with terms. And then we have successor and equality axioms, uh, the standard ones, defining equations for all primitive recursive function symbols here, and uh, uh, the main mechanism of inference, the quantifier free rule of induction. So if one has derived, uh, if phi is some uh, quantifier free formula, then from phi of zero and phi of x implies phi of uh, x plus one, we may infer phi of x. So here, uh, of course, uh, the language has no quantifiers. Therefore, all variables are free and they are understood as implicitly universally quantified. So when we assert phi of x, it means that for all x, phi of x. So something like that. So this is the basic uh, principles that are considered, usually considered to be uh, acceptable by finitists. Uh, uh, one can also remark here that there is an equivalent, equivalent purely equational formulation of primitive recursive arithmetic. Uh, that is, we may abandon even uh, quantifier free logic. So basic formulas are then equations between primitive recursive terms. And we have equational reasoning and one can replace uh, this rule of induction by another form, equational form of induction rule, which uh, delivers then uh, an equivalent uh, uh, formal system. So in equational PRA, one can in fact introduce all this uh, extra mechanisms, logical connectives and so on. So that's uh, the basic formal system, which allows us to illustrate some uh, uh, or to, to discuss uh, further issues. Okay. Uh, can one, uh, so as I mentioned before for Hilbert, uh, uh, in the context of Hilbert's program, it was not really necessary to uh, clearly delineate uh, uh, the extent of finitistic methods because he hoped that uh, after uh, one sees an actual finitistic proof of consistency, that particular proof can be recognized uh, as such, and uh, the problem simply will not arise. Uh, however, later, uh, several people uh, came uh, forward with uh, suggestions which uh, provide, uh, which uh, uh, no, uh, which seek uh, uh, some kind of uh, answer to this question, what is, what exactly are finitistic methods? 
And there are two such suggestions uh, uh, that I know. Uh, the first one historically was Kreisel's uh, solution. And the answer of Kreisel is essentially uh, that finitistic methods F are uh, equivalent to for all exists theorems of piano arithmetic, of first order, full first order piano arithmetic. Here, uh, we will be discussing this uh, at length later, but a uh, much simpler solution is by Tate, uh, William Tate, who uh, uh, provided arguments and suggested to identify finitistic methods uh, just with primitive recursive arithmetic. Uh, uh, that was around 1970, and Kreisel was around 1958, published in first paper in 1960. Uh, what can be so? Clearly, these two answers uh, uh, are different. So, PRA strictly is strictly is a, uh, strictly contained in in uh, for all exist theorems of PA. Uh, so the answers are different, and one can uh, discuss which one of them is more, let's say, uh, plausible, given all the philosophical assumptions uh, that go into the notion of finitism. Um, until now, there is no agreement on, on this. Uh, each of these solutions has its own advantages and disadvantages, and uh, the simplest ones are uh, about Kreisel, Kreisel solution is in fact technically very complicated. It's messy and it is, uh, I would say, goes contrary to the uh, natural idea that finitistic reasoning is close, somehow closely represents the usual human contentual reasoning. That's not so for Kreisel's solution. Its solution uh, in that regard is much better because it's, firstly, it is simple. And there is no doubt that PRA is contained in finitistic methods. And uh, uh, everything would be fine, except that Hilbert and Bernays actually wrote uh, somewhere in, 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 their, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in their, in their book, uh, that Ackermann function is also finitistic. So at least it seems uh, this was discovered by Richard Zach, who actually spent a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, did a lot of work on studying uh, Hilbert's program and finitism in, in all uh, kinds of aspects. And in fact, uh, one can uh, imagine why, why this is so. So there is nothing, let's say there is no uh, impenetrable border between primitive recursive functions and Ackermann functions. So Ackermann function is defined in, in practically similar way only with double recursion rather than single primitive recursion. So uh, why should we prohibit uh, double recursion is not so uh, clear. Uh, finally, I would like to remark that I'm not aware of any other concrete proposals about explication of finitism, but I uh, uh, would uh, uh, expect that there could be some. So I have not studied all the literature about it uh, in, in sufficient amount of detail. Okay, let's go to the next. Okay, what uh, what are Kreisel's? Uh, now we are switching to discussion of Kreisel's suggestion. And Kreisel uh, 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 wrote on finitism in three places. Uh, these are three Kreisel, Kreisel papers. So of them, the first one, I think, is the most interesting because it's, it provides its, the motivation. Uh, it, all the ideas there are in, in the original, somehow, vivid form. It's it's interesting to read, but uh, the paper is messy and uh, it's very, very uh, incomplete, uh, confusing, etc. So one can complain about this paper also a lot. Uh, then uh, uh, something like 10 years later, Kreisel published uh, another version of this with some different discussion, but not uh, 
uh, I wouldn't say uh, deviating too much. And uh, paper three is um, part, uh, some remarks on it in, in essentially a textbook. So this is uh, rather short remarks, but also add something to, uh, to, the, uh, to this problem. So the suggestion was the same in all of these, in all of these publications. Uh, it is interesting, and it's, I think it's a really a good motivation for studying this question today. Uh, so, uh, Kreisel's motivation, rather than pursuing Hilbert's program or something, uh, was uh, completely orthogonal to, to the original uh, ideas of Hilbert. So, he begins his, uh, his paper by these three, essentially, claims. So, first, uh, one can observe that uh, by Gödel's first incompleteness, or at least I can interpret it so that Gödel's first incompleteness theorem, the informal notion of arithmetic truth, cannot be formalized in the originally intended sense of formalization. So this is practically a quotation from, from Kreisel paper. However, this does not preclude the formalization of other informal notions. For example, certain informal incomplete methods of proof. So arithmetic truth is of course complete, but not formalizable. Uh, but uh, apparently there are some, let's say, philosophically, uh, let's say philosophically motivated or delineated methods of proof adhering to certain philosophical principles. And it would be nice, uh, Kreisel thinks, to characterize this, uh, these methods essentially by testing our ability or the ability of uh, formal logic to really model mathematical reasoning. So I guess for when we teach logic to students, we usually tell them that, uh, okay, logic is a way of modeling mathematical reasoning. So of course, as any model of anything, models are uh, imprecise, they lack certain features, sometimes even important features, but they capture some uh, characteristics of the uh, of, uh, uh, of the phenomenon that is being modeled. So uh, like the phenomenon of contentious mathematical proof. Uh, of course, this, uh, uh, let's say, the fact that uh, formal logical systems can model anything is very important uh, as a kind of important motivation for <laughs> mathematical logic in general, because if they cannot model anything, then they're no, not good at all. One can forget about this and, and be happy. So, so uh, clearly for Kreisel, that, that was an attempt to, to check whether, it, whether this modeling idea would work in for some concepts he sort of uh, considered to be more or less defined, like finitist proof and similarly predicative proof. Okay, do not forget to cite Dennis Court. Okay, now I will switch to uh, another PDF. Uh, so. Okay, I hope this is I hope this is visible to some extent. So this is a short this is a short uh, paragraph written by Dana Scott uh, in review section of the Journal of Symbolic Logic, and that's his review of Kreisel's paper. I'm going to talk about so. Uh, uh, he begins with as follows. This brief paper is an ex exceptionally clear description of the author's program for making precise the notion of affinitist proof in arithmetic. The notion itself is not finitist, but this does not mean it cannot be defined mathematically. Just as the fact that arithmetic truth is not arithmetical does not mean that the definition in, say, second-order arithmetic is incorrect. 
an indication of the fruitfulness of the author's definition, which involves a more explicit version of Turing's concept of ordinal logics, is provided by the fact that one can actually establish results about what is provable infinitist arithmetic. So this is an interesting point, uh, which many mathematicians share, is that actually the indication of a fruitfulness of a concept is its, uh, let's say, mathematical naturality and applicability uh, 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 to uh, proving mathematical results. So if the, if the concept somehow works mathematically, then that's an indication that it's interesting and probably is correct. So here that's uh, uh, how Dennis Scott assesses this, uh, this paper. For example, universal existential sentences where A is recursive predicate are finitistically meaningful. Uh, though propositional combinations of them may not be, and the author outlines a method of proof for showing that such a sentence can be established by finitist mean, means, even only if it is provable in the ordinary system Z of first order arithmetic. Of course, this result is of very little comfort to the strict finitist, for he cannot understand the meaning of a proof in Z. At this point, the author supplies a highly interesting and a highly interesting alternative for the poor finitist. In the first place, he recalls uh, his previous result that the for all exist sentences provable in Z are exactly the same as for all exist sentences provable in system H of intuitionistic arithmetic due to Heighton. Uh, this purely syntactical theorem is finitistically meaningful and finitistically established. And then in the next step, the author shows the finitist uh, shows the finities how to make any proof in H of an for exist sentence and transcribe it mechanically into a valid finities proof of the same sentence by means of a very natural translation procedure. Thus, even though the finities has no conception of the totality of all finities proofs, he has a perfectly definite way of obtaining from proofs in Z or results he can understand, proofs he can also understand. That's very strange. Uh, in fact, situation, if you think about it. <coughs> the curious situation is that the finitist can never comprehend why the method always works. But the achievement of the author is that he can make us understand the reason. Unfortunately, this paper gives only an outline of the details needed to make these results concrete. Let us hope the author will publish them soon along with his work on predicative proof, which is also alluded here. Okay, that's all the uh, that's all the um, uh, re uh, review by Dana Scott. Uh, so uh, apparently, as, as many of Kreisel's papers, this was very inspirational, and it is. But it also admits that this is just an outline, and not a rigorous uh, mathematical paper, as uh, as one would say. And I can only add, despite the three papers, the details have never been worked out in sufficient detail. So this is still, I would say, to be considered a program for the future. Okay. Uh, now uh, I, I, I come to the, uh, let's say, outline of some ideas that go into Kreisel's uh, solution. And the main mechanism uh, he applies is this, uh, what I call extension by reflection. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, uh, it goes to this. Um, suppose, uh, so Kreisel writes, uh, puts it as follows, suppose P, has been recognized by finitist means as a partial formalization of finitistic reasoning expressed as a probability predicate. Probability predicate in arithmetic. So P of X is uh, existential arithmetical formula, uh, which somehow previously or at the outset has been recognized by finitist as adequately representing part of finitistic reasoning. So partial formalization means here, it need not be, uh, actually, uh, let's say, probability predicate for all, for the system F, so to say, as a whole, but only 
for a part of it. Now suppose a finitist is able to prove for n p of a of n, of numeral n. So in other words, suppose a finitist is able to prove that for all n, it is provable that a of numeral n. Then the finitist may conclude for all n, a of n. In other words, finitistic reasoning f should be closed under this so-called reflection rule. If f proves for all n, p of a of n, then f proves for all n, a of n. So as I said, so P uh, is somehow a subsystem of F, but formalized in this case. So uh, this sounds, uh, I would say, uh, uh, rather convincing, uh, or at least uh, 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 there's nothing wrong with, uh, with um, uh, assuming that phenogistic reasoning should be clear, can be closed under this rule. However, we see that, uh, uh, or we will see in a moment, that by Gödel's theorem, this uh, already leads us outside uh, the, uh, the phenogistic reasoning, the part of phenogistic reasoning that was formalized in P. So this goes beyond P. And therefore, that's this rule actually extends p. So let's see how it how it works by considering three examples. Uh, examples are quite standard and simple. So first example is let p be a pre probability predicate for primitive recursive arithmetic, which, as we know, uh, is usually accepted as a partial formalization of finitism. So if you are now a finitist you may actually, like, for example, Hilbert and Bernays, they wrote a book where they practically stated all the axioms and rules of PRA as, as finitistic. So they accept PRA as finitistic system. And then, so it can be arithmetized and there is a predicate P. Uh, okay, uh, let A of N express uh, uh, the statement that n is not the good number of a proof of contradiction in PRA. So that's a primitive recursive formula or quantified free formula of primitive recursive arithmetic. And then let phi denote this, this sentence for all n, p of a of n. Uh, we know that it is true, right? Because uh, uh, by the principle that uh, uh, Okay, there is no proof of a contradiction in PRA, therefore, uh, which simply means uh, that A of N is true for each N, and therefore, since A of N is primitive recursive, it is provable, and then it is, uh, it is true. Moreover, PRA proves phi. Hence, one would be able to conclude finitistically for all N, A of N, which means consistency of PRA. So application of of this uh, reflexive uh, reflection rule allows one uh, to derive consistency of PRA from PRA. So say that's a uh, uh, proper extension. Uh, now, how one maybe uh, it's also good to to remind or to to demonstrate how is it that PRA is able to prove this sentence that for all NP of A of N. So this is an uh, argument that appeared in many, many, in many, many uh, situations and has proved to be very useful always. Uh, here it is in its simplest, purest form. So if A of N reason in PRA, if A of N holds, then P, P of A of N numeral n holds by provable primitive recursive completeness. So quantify free formulas, if true, must be provable. And this fact itself is provable in PRA. So that's well known. In the case that A of n is false, we know that n is not the total number of a proof of contradiction in PRA by the meaning of A of n which means, uh, which implies uh, in particular that there is such a proof of contradiction. So we have 
can demonstrate constructively that zero equals one is provable, P of zero equals one. And then we can conclude P of A of N by formalization of X falso. Also. Uh, so, which is again the principle of classical logic, which is applicable here without problems because the formulas are quantifier free. So classical logic applies to quantifier free formulas. And in fact, PRA is, is both classical and intuitionistically acceptable. So it's so small that it is contained both in classical and intuitionistic constructive arithmetic. Okay, so that's the argument which uh, is somehow uh, uh, has this dichotomy and it is it relies on decidability of A of N, either A of N or not A of N, but as I said, A of N is quantified free, so that's easy. Uh, now something uh, a little bit more interesting. So consider the example two. Uh, let now A of N express uh, a stronger statement, n is not the, or another statement, n is not the given number of a proof of contradiction in piano arithmetic, in PA. So rather than speaking about proofs in PRA, we now speak about proofs in PA, which is perfectly possible to do in PRA because PA can be arithmetized in a standard manner. Let P be a probability predicate in PRA as before. So we, change a of n, we do not change p. And the formula of i is, again, would be as before, but now it's it's, it's a different formula. So phi uh, is for one p of a of n. And we, again, as before, can conclude that formula phi is true. However, now our belief that phi is true is based on the belief in the consistency of p a essentially on, for, on the formula for all n a of n. Because in order to, uh, to conclude that uh, uh, for all n, there is a proof that a of n, we usually say that, okay, uh, p a is consistent, therefore, uh, 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 therefore for each n particular n there is no proof n is not a proof of contradiction and since this fact is primitive recursive it must be provable therefore p of a of n so that's how we actually reason so we use the, the assumption uh, so to conclude that phi is true we use consistency of p a in fact uh, one can uh, rather easily show that in this case over PRA, uh, this formula phi is equivalent to this conditional kind of consistency of PA. So phi is equivalent to the statement uh, that if one, if PRA is consistent, then PA is consistent. So, uh, uh, yeah. Very well, but then uh, this means that PRA does not do phi, and the extension rule, as formulated by Kreisel for this particular pair PA, does not apply. So we cannot use it to infer consistency of PA uh, from nothing uh, by reflection. Uh, example three, uh, yet another example. Uh, so um, maybe even more interesting. So let now uh, A of N express as before that N is not the good number of a proof of contradiction in PA. So A speaks about PA and let, and let P be a probability predicate for PA itself. So not for PRA, but for PA. What can we say? Then PRA proves again the formula phi by the same kind of reasoning as before, even though both P and A are now related to PA rather than PRA. This is due to the fact that PRA has this provable completeness proof of property for uh, quantify free formulas. And uh, the reasoning itself, this meta reasoning was actually available in PRA. So this is the extension rule applies in this situation. So we may infer consistency of PA. However, 
we have no reason to accept P, uh, the predicate, uh, the probability predicate for PA, as a partial formalization of finitistic reasoning, because we don't have any reason to do that. So this is not a valid extension by reflection, unless we accept PA in advance, accept PA as finitistic, which nobody does, but uh, okay. Uh, so that's uh, that's a very uh, uh, peculiar. That's a peculiarity of this situation. So uh, the rule has this. Uh, re let's return to it. One uh, this item one in 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 this. Um, maybe I can even write here. This, this one should be able to. So this item one. So uh, makes it not a simply applicable inference rule. So it, it applies once one has established that P is a uh, is an acceptable probability predicate. Oh, maybe one more uh, here. Yeah, this rule. So to apply the extension, one needs to be one needs to recognize uh, uh, that P of X is a partial formalization of finitistic reality. So of all these uh, examples, I would say Kreisel would, uh, uh, ex, uh, let's say, consider this uh, first situation, example one, proving consistency of PA as completely finitistic. So that's, uh, uh, but not the other two, each for different reasons. Okay, uh, so uh, here is this uh, partial conclusion that uh, by Gödel's second theorem, as Kreisel and Dana Scott noted, uh, finitism goes beyond any partial formalization of, of its P, of any formal system partially formalizing finitism. So, therefore, as Kaiser puts it, if the notion of finitist proof is capable of formalization at all, its proof predicate must not be recognizable as such by finitist means. So that's the kind of um, informal conclusion from Gödel's second incomplete theorem that uh, applies in this situation. Okay. Notice that it already involves some a uh, rather vague notion of recognizability of a proof predicates by finitist means, which uh, of course needs some uh, explanation. So remarks here are uh, two remarks. So first, in general, it is not clear on which grounds can a finitist accept or discard probability predicates. It uh, seems to be a difficult task for a finitist. And second remark is that there is nothing specifically finitistic about the extension by reflection. It would also apply to other concepts as well. In fact, Kreisel, Kreisel's and Pfefferman's explication of predicativity uh, involves the same kind of rule. So, uh, uh, so that's, um, that's what we... Uh, are confronted with here. Um, to proceed, let me, uh, how much time have I used and how much time do I have? 20, 20 minutes, okay, good. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, good. So uh, quickly, let, let's quickly go over Hilbert and Bernays' uh, remarks on feminism because this is our main source sort of official source of information of what finitism should mean. Uh, otherwise we can fantasize or invent our own interesting concepts, which is a good idea maybe, but uh, we will be, certainly what Hilbert and Bernays wrote is, is relevant here. Also, I know that they wrote it in the second edition of, of, of their book, which is already after Gödel's theorem. So that's a late, 
views of Hilbert and Brenner. I said it's not early Hilbert, Hilbert, early naive Hilbert on, on finitism. That's rather not naive Bernays. Okay, so what are the features of finitism? So firstly, natural numbers are sequences of stroke symbols, such as zero, zero prime, zero double prime, et cetera, et cetera. So finitism for Bernays is essentially about manipulation of symbols. So that's their main field, so to say, which is understandable because, okay, formal proofs are symbolic. So we sort of uh, adapt our our uh, methods to that. Okay, now what uh, principles of proof go into finitistic reasoning? So first such simplest principle is calculation or computation. So we can prove that two plus plus three equals five uh, by direct computation. So we have a definition essentially of plus is for us a program that we need to count by one and put strokes all together and then we can compute essentially the, the result of uh, two plus three and compare the two sequences of strokes and uh, Bernays goes at length uh, uh, analyze, uh, presenting the, uh, let's say, explaining why uh, we have a finitistically acceptable algorithm of comparison of two strings of strokes. Okay, nothing surprising. So uh, elementary reasoning with, uh, with uh, uh, numerals are fine. Uh, now we come to uh, quantifier free formulas or identities such as x plus zero equals x, etc. So as I mentioned before, these are understood as implicitly universally quantified. And uh, they explain it by uh, thought experiments. So in order to, how can we explain the meaning of, of this, uh, of the sentence for all x, x plus zero equals x. Okay, that means that if we uh, write any numeral n, substitute it for x and compute the result, then the, uh, 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 the two sides, the, the results on the left hand side and on the right hand side will be the same. So very natural, but uh, so it does not presuppose the actual totality of, of natural numbers. Uh, okay, so here is an example of, of, of this reasoning uh, from, from a letter where I deleted some unnecessary parts to, to be, uh, uh, to be uh, short. Uh, so, uh, I guess everyone can, can read that, but uh, so uh, that's a typical example how, how a finitist would perceive numerical or, or such equations such as a square minus b square equals a plus b. And uh, uh, okay, this, uh, uh, this boy did not um, uh, find the proof of it, although he perhaps could. Uh, because he couldn't find uh, the solution in internet. But, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> oh. However, there, you can ask, uh, there is also something interesting about this, uh, something more serious about it, because one can ask, uh, let's say, why, was he, why did he actually fail to find this proof? Because I'm pretty sure that uh, children of 80 or eighth grade in school, they know everything about symbolic manipulation, opening brackets, etc. I think that the, re the main reason here was that he didn't, by, uh, by formulating the result in this form with two variables, he didn't have a clue that one can actually substitute terms. He lacked the substitution rule. So, uh, what he didn't like is this basic finitistic testing, like, uh, and uh, could test it for as experiment, experimental fact. But uh, okay, substituting b plus one for a uh, is a certain leap of uh, of reasoning, which is by the way available in PRA, uh, but um, it's a separate rule. And here we see that uh, it is not always trivial. Okay. Uh, uh, good, uh, let's go to the next. Okay, uh, finitistically meaningful statements. So uh, Hilbert and Bernays uh, claim that finitistic statements 
do have some limited, uh, may have some limited use of quantifiers, which is very essential for Kreisel's proposal because he has both universal and existential quantifiers. So as far as universal quantifiers are, are concerned, so this is already explained by this thought experiment. So in this sense, 4x, 5x is a hypothetical statement, they call it. And they write that there is an x, phi of x does not have, phi is quantified free here. So there is an x, phi of x does not have a, a direct meaning. Uh, however, we can assert that there is an x, phi of x is true if we are given a concrete n such that we can verify that phi of n is true by calculation. So in that sense, there is an x, phi of x is a partial statement, as they put it about a more complete statement phi of n, stronger, we would say statement phi of n for a concretely given n, or a way of construct such an n together with a bound on the number of necessary steps to be executed. In other words, instead of numeral n, we will be also satisfied with a program to compute uh, such numeral. Okay. Uh, somewhat more complicated expressions uh, can also be interpreted phenotistically like, like this one, uh, but also in this sense as a partial statement about the construction T of X is that this always holds. Okay, so, uh, but more complicated uh, quantified combinations are not directly, are not meaningful. Uh, interesting case is also negation. So negation is classical for quantifier free formulas. This is uh, not, not problematic. Then they write that not for not there is an x phi of x means the same thing as for x not phi of x by definition. Uh, whereas not for x phi of x does not have affinitistic meaning. Again, it can be strengthened to the assertion phi of n for a given n, but this is not the exact opposite of for all x phi of x. Therefore, the law of excluded middle does not hold in general for this for quantified formulas. It does hold for open formulas. Okay, that's basically what Hilbert and Bernays think about quantifiers. An important uh, issue is uh, uh, definitions of functions. Uh, so if we were, uh, if finitism was just about this basic uh, quantifier free logic over some fixed vocabulary, it will be rather weak. We will not be able to prove, uh, for example, that exponentiation, for example, we have plus and times, what, but then we would like exponentiation. However, explicitly Bernays discusses primitive recursion as a means of, uh, of extending the vocabulary. Uh, so primitive recursion, however, is not understood as some kind of uh, Again, equations that hold in a universe of numbers, uh, but rather computationally. So this pair of equation is just, uh, let's say, uh, the notation of a program for computing f of n m given as input the numerals n and m. So that's uh, how one would uh, compute simply by reducing from left to right as one usually does. So this is. Uh, the mechanical understanding of finitist functions. So therefore we essentially arrive at this system, which is equivalent to PRA. Okay, now a few words about uh, Kreisel's uh, proposal now. And we can test it against this uh, philosophical principle that we have. So I will not be uh, explaining it in detail because as I said, it is very complicated. Moreover, it is not quite, uh, let's say, uh, mathematically rigorous as presented by Kreisel. So uh, therefore I outline the main idea and the details should be should take care of themselves. So to say, as usually Kreisel uh, wrote his papers. So we are now uh, using this idea of autonomous progression. Uh, what is autonomous progression? So we are dealing with a family of systems, SA, indexed by primitive recursive ordinal notations. Now, what is ordinal notation? So notation A, we can think of uh, such a notation A as a point in some primitive recursive well-ordering on natural numbers. 
and by a in a module uh, uh, absolute value a is is uh, my notation for its order type uh, so um, so we are instead of dealing with a single system we deal with this rather large family of systems but it is primitive really because it uh, it is indexed by numbers which encode this uh, well ordering uh, now the definition the chrysler definition then goes by defining sa the system sa essentially by iterating a many times uh, the extension principle by sigma one reflection over pra so sigma one formulas are understood in chrysler system roughly in accordance with this idea of uh, constructive existential quantifier but then we uh, apply this rule not once not twice but we are able to apply or should be able to apply it uh, any given times where a is uh, any primitive recursive uh, well ordering um, we accept a system SA as a partial formalization of finitism as soon as A is proved to be a well ordering in some system SB, which is already accepted. So, in order to, we do not accept all these systems SA as finitistic, but rather as potentially, so to say, finitistic. And uh, the system SA is accepted once we have an actual proof that A is a well ordering in some system as B, for which we already, that we have already accepted. And then H is the union of all systems as A for acceptable notations A. So that's the rough outline of, of Kreisel's idea. Uh, what is uh, the role of well ordering conditions? Uh, it is well known, uh, it's a technical result, but uh, rather clear that if A is actually not well ordered, then the system SA may be inconsistent. So iterating reflection along a non-well-founded ordering is uh, dangerous if that ordering has provably descending sequences, uh, then the system is uh, uh, maybe in fact inconsistent. Well-foundness of, of an ordering, a primitive recursive well or, or ordering uh, curly less than, uh, is expressed, for example, by this, by such a statement. For all f, for all functions f, there is an n such that f encodes for any sequence f. Uh, there is a number n such that the value, the next value of the sequence is not less than the previous value, something like this. <laughs> so that's the statement of well-foundedness. However, it involves universal quantification over functions. Uh, this is dangerous because, uh, firstly, this is prima facie second order statement. Moreover, if we replace it with some weaker condition quantifying over some small subset of functions, small or smaller subset of functions, for example, one could uh, say, okay, instead of quantifying over f, let's consider primitive recursive functions, f and primitive recursive well foundings. Not so easy because well ordered structures can become non well ordered once new functions appear or become available in your system. Uh, so uh, if you are defining uh, well ordered this condition, if you want it to mean the same condition also at later stages of your construction. So basically your uh, principle is to extend and extend and extend your system. So by doing this, you extend the class of functions of that systems. Therefore you extend the class of potentially descending, infinitely descending sequences. And then something that was well-founded or appeared to be well-founded before may not be well-founded any, any longer. So that's a problem. However, Kreisel, in that particular paper, he ignores this problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Uh, quantifying all functions is not finitistic, so it's problematic uh, to rigorously uh, formulate the acceptance condition in the context of partial finitism. So this is not a, a good, a very well motivated move. Uh, Kreisel's main results, or rather, I would say rather claims, 
are that uh, these three things. So finitistic reasoning is identified with such an autonomous progression, somehow defined, but not completely rigorously. Then he claims that functions provably total in H are provably total in piano arithmetic, and vice versa, piano arithmetic is pi zero too conservative over H, which is achieved by an interesting construction uh, of interpretation of intuitionistic arithmetic uh, in, uh, in H, somewhat analogous to Gödel's interpretation of intuitionistic logic in S4. So he presents an explicit or at least claims uh, uh, that probability predicate in H essentially satisfies the principle, uh, the principles of uh, S4 here. Doubtful, but nevertheless. Conclusions. Kreisel's proposal is technically uh, sophisticated and mathematically interesting. There are lots of issues can be discussed uh, in technical terms, which I find uh, quite uh, quite interesting. It presupposes, however, that affinitist uh, has rather limited abilities as to uh, abilities to handle abstract statements about numbers. However, he or she can do an awful lot of self-reflection, even transfinitely many steps, which I found, uh, which I find rather strange. Why should, uh, let's say, Consider this uh, uh, example of naive infinitists uh, from, from school. Uh, obviously, self-reflection was not something he, he would easily do. Um, and third point is that technical details in the paper are not accurate. In the current, in the current form, I'm pretty sure it does not work. Kreisel suggestions. Main issue is uh, the second order well-foundedness condition. However, the interpretation he suggests is also problematic. Nevertheless, I think it's quite plausible that the system can be somehow repaired and stated rigorously in some form. I won't, I hasn't been able to do it so far, but nevertheless, it seems likely that given our knowledge about all these technical mechanisms, it's possible to formulate it rigorously. And final, final word, what's, what if it seems natural in view of all this to, to simply abandon the idea of transfinite iteration of the reflection principle. We can admit reflection principle as a finitistic way of reasoning. So a finitist can do, can reflect over partial formalizations of finitism, but he can do it only finitely many times, seems to me, for example. Then one would obtain the following results. Uh, so firstly, if one initially accepts primitive recursive arithmetic, say, a la Hilbert and Bernays, saying, okay, we already believe in PRA, we are finitists, and we believe that PRA is finitistic. Uh, then the resulting system obtained by this non-transfinite iteration of, of sigma one reflection is the system denoted sigma one, omega times iterated sigma one reflection over PRA, and its provable functions are those of the omega of omega plus omega level of the Grzegorczyk uh, hierarchy, which is, you can also describe as functions, primitive recursive in the Ackermann function. So that's basically the, the answer one would get here. However, if one starts with something weaker than PRA, for example, elementary common elementary arithmetic, uh, then the resulting system by this process of sigma one, iterated sigma one reflection, will uh, lead you precisely to primitive recursive arithmetic itself. So the ordinal, uh, so if one measures this in terms of this uh, pi two, pi zero two ordinals, then uh, uh, primitive recursive arithmetic is, uh, ordinal is omega, and this one is omega plus omega. So that's basically the, the answer one would uh, uh, get by, uh, let's say, simplifying Kreisel's idea, but that's not a big deal. Maybe actual finitism goes far beyond that. Who knows? Thank you very much. Excellent talk. Oh, thank you very much for your excellent talk.
Uh, but uh, no, unfortunately, no you have no time for questions. What should we do? Very short. Very short. One. <laughs> Are there? Yes, uh, well, thank you. Great talk and uh, great attempt. But also, this reminds me another uh, very ambitious project by Kreisel, mm -hmm. uh, namely formalization of BHK semantics for intrinsic logic. And it's the same pattern, probably typical for Kreisel now, I can see. A brilliant idea, very ambitious. But whenever it comes to the, formalis the, the formal systems, then it fails pretty badly. So in both cases, it's uh, either inconsistent or really um, contradicts the original intuition, like in your case. But in both cases, there are brave young people in, uh, in just another student, of, former student of mine, Walter Dean, who is mm -hmm. now working to repair the uh, Chrysal system uh, mm -hmm. for BHK semantics. And, um, uh, it's a very reasonable enterprise to see what kind of, how much could be saved out of this brilliant idea. And uh, I think that uh, your, uh, your effort with Albert is, uh, even, has even more sense because the finitistic method is something which is in the air and foundations. We really have to clear this out and it's not actually sufficient effort. Uh, basically there's two, idea, two big, big names involved who really tried out of mathematicians, who tried really to make sense uh, whatever, to the extent possible uh, about these ideas. So just just some observations. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So it's uh, good to know about Walter Dean. He also wrote uh, some papers about this reflection, reflection in arithmetic from- Yeah, absolutely. He's, he's highly professional and very qualified. And so, and also has very good foundation on tuition. So uh, please, I wish you, like Kolmogorov once told me uh, himself, and by the way, Kolmogorov also shared his personal views about foundations, and he said that the, the Hilbert's ideas were probably right to have some limited trusted core mm -hmm. and to prove the rest of math consistent based on this trusted core. And then we can actually be saved because we cannot read mathematics of abstract methods. We need them. So the, the whole thing makes sense. And you're in a very good trend. Albert too, and best regards to Albert too. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry we should stop here. <laughs> <laughs>